So hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Last time I came to the ESSEC Business School was about almost 20 years ago for a Nuit de l'ESSEC. <laughs> or Nuit la plus chaude, maybe. I don't remember very well. But uh, I'm very happy to be here and well, I'm going to introduce myself very quickly. Uh, I studied, studied a lot, maybe too much. Um, studied at several schools uh, around Paris. And then um, I started a PhD, but I I had an entrepreneur's uh, uh, mind as well, so I created a startup in iPhone applications development, 2008, which was not a great success on a financial point of view, but uh, an excellent experience. Then I became a consultant, worked on uh, digital topics uh, in many sectors, many countries, on uh, so digital uh, strategy definition, uh, implementation of huge programs uh, around digital, etc. And I worked in 2015 in Dubai for a World Expo called Dubai 2020. So a World Expo that is going to be organized in 2020. And with my team, we're in charge of defining the digital roadmap for the World Expo, which means um, starting with customer journeys, of all the stakeholders that are going to be uh, involved in the expo before, during, and after the expo, identifying the pain points, identifying the digital relievers uh, in all types, uh, everything that is linked, linked to digital. So social is one of them, but uh, linked to IoT, to big data, to mobility applications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then build some, um, some catalog of digital services and define the roadmap for the next few years. And that's when I met with Sprinkler. Uh, because we identify Sprinkler as a very good partner for what we call the customer experience management. And we'll see why uh, it's really became, it, it really became a customer experience management company and not just a social uh, media management platform. We're going to see why the, the experience is really uh, critical. Um, I mean, these things you know, but we're going to go into some details on that. So I met, we worked with Google Middle East, we worked with Facebook, we worked with several companies, and we worked with Sprinkler. So that's when I met with Sprinkler, then I joined Sprinkler in 2016 to work in a team of six people um, in the world, uh, working with our main prospects and clients to, think, to, to understand their strategic outcomes, the, the strategy, and how to translate what they're looking for in terms of strategy into some business use cases that could be achievable with a Sprinkler. Um, so I'm used to talking to execs. I'm less used to talking to students, but that's a great opportunity. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions, of course. Uh, in case you tweet, you can use these uh, this, uh, um, handles, Nikos Pai or Spr Sprinkler Friends, the, so that the marketing at Sprinkler will see that. Um, in case you tweet, please don't tweet pictures with some information that could be confidential. If you wonder if they are confidential, then don't tweet them. Otherwise, you can tweet whatever you want. Um, so, I'm sure you are very familiar with social media. Who uses uh, WeChat on a daily basis? Two people? Three? Who uses Snapchat? Okay. Um, Instagram, everyone? Almost? No? Who uses no none of the three I just quoted? Okay. You are on LinkedIn? Yes. Yes. You are on Facebook? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are you on Peach? No, I'm not. Okay. Well, we'll see. There are so many social media with uh, the Sprinkler platform. We'll see how we connect to more than 20 social media and how companies can actually leverage everything that you guys do on social media with the idea of so, yeah, probably making more revenues and decreasing the cost, but also providing you with a, a very, an exceptional customer experience. So what we're going to see in this class, uh, we'll, we'll start with the age of, the, of customer centricity and the importance of having the customer at the center of every strategy. It may be something that you've been hearing uh, again and again in your classes, but we'll see how it, it, it's really true with social as well. And this was actually the fundamental reason to create Sprinkler. Then we're going to go into what a social disruption strategy could be and uh, how it is part of the global digital uh, disruption strategy in general and how to build them. And then we're going to see some pain points that the companies can have in different sectors and how they can, um, they can 
cope with these pain points through social media and through a platform like Sprinkler. So we're going to see a few use cases per verticals, um, talking about a few of our clients. So that may be a little bit confidential, but uh, we'll see. So the rules have changed. And just a quick question, have you ever looked for or Googled Comcast? No? Yes? What, uh, what have you found? Uh huh. And basically, they have a monopoly on the market. That's why. That's right. Exactly. Very good point. And um, have you looked at the images linked to that? No. Well, Are you guys all familiar with that? Uh, Comcast. So, cable company in the US. And yes, monopoly because actually there are two or three companies and they have some uh, monopoly per region, per state, uh, per geographies. So, Comcast, cable provider in the US. Um, if you are in the zone where you there is only Comcast, you have to subscribe to Comcast, but they provide such a bad uh, customer experience that these are the images linked to Comcast. I mean, it was 2017. Now they've been working on both uh, deleting these kind of pictures because of their brand reputation, but they have also worked a lot on customer experience and on providing a better customer experience through many ways, one of these being social. We're going to see how. Um, but just to give you an idea, the, the, the rules have changed and now the customer can really have a, a huge impact on, uh, on companies and on brand reputation and actually in the end on market cap, on the, the brand value of the, the companies. So why such hatred? We have one, uh, one picture here in, this, uh, in these pictures, someone explaining that they, he's calling Comcast forever, never got an answer, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the actually, actually the epitome of a bad customer experience. Any idea on the total circulation of the top 20 selling fashion magazines, top 20 fashion selling in the US? Raw number? Circulation number of copies that they uh, sell every week, prints. Well, A little bit more. So these are the magazines. And well, the figure is 17 million, which is not bad. So a company, let's say L'Oreal, who wants to advertise in these uh, magazines will get a reach of 17 million plus all the people that are going to read that. And the fact that uh, the, the reason why I put this example at the beginning is the, well, easy comparison with the number of followers of Kim Kardashian on Instagram. Do you have an ID? 60 million. That was maybe four months ago. Now we have 107 million. So just compare the 17 million with just having Kim Kardashian posting a, a, a picture on a L'Oreal product, for instance. So you can see the difference and how the rules have changed, how the companies are not at the center of everything. Now they don't have the power. The customer has taken the power, not only the customers, but the influencers like Kim Kardashian. Look at this example, Calvin Klein, more than 2 million likes just for a picture. Clearly, I mean, that's clearly an advertisement for Calvin Klein. Posted by Kim Kardashian, much more efficient than posting, pu putting it in the print copies. Yeah. Yes. Probably people look at it and don't like it. So, how can you measure the whole? So, measurement is a key question. Um, you can measure the, the reach, you can measure the number of likes plus the number of people who have seen that. You cannot measure the number of people who don't like it but don't say it. That's for sure. What you can actually measure, and that's what uh, we do at Sprinkler, is all types of public data. So, we can't measure things that are not public data. but Based on public data, you can have a, the number of KPIs we have in the platform is over 1,000, and then we can create some indexes, some um, customized KPIs based on what the objective of the brand is. This is the most important thing. If, I mean, a brand can have two types of objectives when launching a campaign. It can be brand reputation around the brand, or it can be performance about uh, trying to convert a sale, to convert uh, an advertisement into a sale. Both can be tracked. 
you can track the brand reputation through uh, the number of shares, number of likes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can also track with some uh, uh, Google Pixels and things thing like this, or Facebook Pixels. You can track the, the the flow between some pictures and then the conversion uh, into a cell and connecting it with a CRM. Um, is this, is it is. They give you the reach, uh, they give you the number of views uh, on Instagram. I don't know why. It's a yeah, actually, it depends on the API limitations of each platform. I think in, on Instagram you can. Okay. And on, so face, Twitter is the most open of all of them. Twitter, you can have basically everything you, you think of or think about. Facebook is more limited. Uh, for media companies, it's very open, for, but for other companies, you can actually monitor, you can really monitor what is posted on your page or your pages, because a company like McDonald's may have dozens of, or thousands of pages, and they, they could manage everything and get the, the figures of everyone posting things on their pages, but it's more limited. And then it depends on each platform. Yeah, you had a question? Uh, yes, later on, please keep your question or I'm going to write it down and I'll show you some dashboard at the end. Okay. Yes. But so actually, um, dashboards, the, it's not a dashboards that would fit for everyone. The idea of creating a dashboard needs some, uh, some thought before. The idea again is to start with the strategy of the company, the objectives of the company and how we will translate that into dashboards. So dashboards would be specific for every company. Uh, when work, working for a tobacco company, we're not going to look for the same things as uh, uh, working for an automotive company, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you can really customize your dashboards depending on uh, the objectives you have and the impact you want to have on the business. If you want to, and through social, you can identify trends, you can identify people complaining, you can actually by listening, you can uh, do many things that will have an impact on your business. So the impact can be on uh, product definition, on marketing decisions, on uh, offering new services, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, or at a micro level on answering to someone who complained about your product. And then based on that, you can measure SLAs, so times to, to answer, et cetera, et cetera, to improve your customer, uh, customer care. So, but I'll show you some dashboards at the end. Um, so yesterday brands, let's be just a little bit conceptual at the beginning, talk about uh, some concepts, very easy to understand, but I think that with uh, some graphics like this, it's even easier. Yesterday brands owned the conversations and communication was one way from the brand to the customers through uh, different uh, channels, television, papers, etc., classical ones. What happened, so today, customers own the conversation because they are talking on social media, not only social media, but uh, messag messaging apps, etc. They are talking and the brands are not the ones who actually master the, the communication and the conversation. So let's have a quick look on the evolution over time of the companies, communications and customers, very broad facts, but just to make you understand what the, the, the huge difference is from some years ago and now. So beginning of the 20th century, I don't, I'm not sure you can see very well, but I'm going to tell you, companies, so manufacturers gain control with big plants. They were able to, to build things that were not possible before with some uh, small workshops. The communication wide uh, was the world, world of mouth, mouth uh, ruled. And then it was, I mean, for the consumers, the idea was to have access to some products. Some years later, the distributors gained control. Uh, you probably know that in the 60s or 50s, hypermarkets became uh, very important. Saint Jean de Bois for the French ones, etc. And then the richer media emerged uh, with the television, etc. And the idea was to have choice, which was something very new for customers. Information age, 90s, technology enablers gained control, Microsoft, Apple, etc. And then, well, start at uh, the, the beginning of internet times, real-time media was the norm. 
And the idea for consumers was to have information, every, all the information they wanted to have. Now, eight, oh, eight of the customer, uh, the consumers gain control. They're connected ev to everyone and from everywhere, and they have increased in expectations. And let's talk about these expectations. So, so, digital customer, I mean, you know that the digital customer is informed, is connected, is empowered, is omni channel, real time, expects visibility, keep, want to keep it real, and is uh, quickly styled in terms of attention. There are new standards, something that you may know as well because you are uh, taking benefits of these standards. Standards uh, defined by these companies, Amazon, Uber, Facebook, Netflix, Google, and the next ones. And the standards are the fact that now you request to have choice in general in your life uh, because on Amazon you have choice, so why wouldn't you have choice in your retail experience in general? Visibility, now who who can imagine not seeing exactly where the driver is when you're going to pick your, your taxi? Really? <laughs> um, Facebook with some relevancy. Well, of course, they're using your data to provide you with some, some uh, insights that should be relevant for you. It's not always perfect, but same for Netflix. It's not always perfect, but it's improving. And then Google with the access of every, all types of information, etc. The thing is that today the, the, the consumers are used to these kind of standards, new standards. And they are expecting these kind of standards with all the brands they are in contact with. And companies, all companies, have to adapt to that. So we can think of some extinction uh, because since the 2000s, uh, half the, the Forbes uh, 2000 have disappeared from the list. And so when you look at it, you can see that the ones who haven't been able to uh, transform th themselves on a digital point of view uh, have disappeared. And in one decade, more than 40% of those left will as well disappear. Um, in, two in 2020, 50% of the employees in the companies will be millennials, will be people like you or a little bit older. Uh, people who will be used to using new technology, to using digital in general, to using social media, etc. So this is something that is that has to be taken into account by by old companies. And the thing is that when I'm talking to execs at companies, they are 50 year old. They are, I mean, they are in, a, in an age where they are not used to using social since they were born, and for them, social maybe is just a an application of their teenagers or, or things like this. They don't always understand the importance of social, but well, with some figures and some explanations, they, they start getting it. So how many tools companies have? Um, and we're gonna see that social can actually have an impact on marketing, on advertising, on research, on commerce, on care. And very often companies have many tools, many point solutions, they, they actually keep the silos they have in terms of departments, many departments, marketing departments having their own tools, care departments having their own tools, etc. So this is a lot of the things I've been talking to you as of uh, till now uh, is an explanation of the creation of Sprinkler. Sprinkler wants to actually provide a unified experience for the companies, uh, take into account the fact that customers have the power and that companies have to provide an, an amazing experience, a great experience for them. And actually, we identified five great challenges that uh, companies have today. This joint data, so every silo, every department has have their own data, own type of data in different formats, etc. and they're not sharing the data. So a uh, marketing department who would maybe identify someone complaining about a product will not share the data or the information with their care department. So a lack of 360 degree view of the customers. Then um, silo teams, we talked about that, but the fact that they are not collaborating is a huge problem for many companies. And I mean, you're used to agile uh, ways of working, etc. It's not natural for big companies or not at all levels. Disparate processes, um, the, the, which actually translate into duplicate work and uh, so point solution tools, we've talked about it, when every department has its own tool without 
integration between the tools, it's very hard for the information to go from one department to another and actually for the companies to leverage it. An, an, intel an intelligent technology with a problem of integration and uh, inability to scale. So all of these have a huge impact on the revenue, on the cost, costs, and on the organizational risk. And these are the f main five challenges that a company like Sprinkler wants to, uh, to help companies cope with. So when you, when you see the interaction between these challenges and the new customer who is in control, who is empowered, you can see that there are three things that should be done, which is actually uh, listen to the customers, engage with them, and reach them. And we're going to see how Sprinkler do that, do, does that. So, um, yeah, we, and actually we want to talk about a system of record, uh, not, of, not a system of record for experience, but a system of engagement. System of record would be a, a CRM, classical CRM. I don't know how, you, how used you are with uh, these kind of tools. Um, so a classical CRM would be a system of record. Would get the data and well, company can use the data afterwards. But the idea of having a real system of engagement is uh, giving the ability, the possibility for the companies to do in both ways. To take the, the data, automatically process it, and then use it to engage with the customer. An idea of the, the type of solutions, and you're going to see with the examples uh, how, um, how it can be uh, used in a daily basis. But you would have, these are a mapping of the kind of the point solutions, and Sprinkler covers every, all of these. Point solution would help you listen to people, listen to what they say, listen, identifying trends, etc. on what people say on social media in general. Uh, they would help you engage with, uh, with them on different social media. So yes, just an explanation of the type of tools you have in this kind of uh, software. There are, so there are tools or point solutions that are linked to inbound, so all the messages that a brand can, can, uh, can get from people sending messages to them or uh, brands looking for messages uh, that have been posted. Outbound, so from the brands to the outwards, to, uh, so publishing, content marketing, advertising, and then some functional um, tools that are used internally. UGC, you all know what UGCs are? UGCs. No? <laughs> so. So they know. No, no, I mean, user? Not, not everyone. It's a digital okay. marketing for user-generated content. Uh, yeah. oh. 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 All right. <laughs> so you have actually a point solution that would help you uh, deal with these UGCs and do some visual listening. Identify. Yes, sure. Absolutely. So UGC, and uh, when there are many UGCs, user generated content. So all the pieces that you, you, you post on Instagram, for instance, can be used by some companies, if it's a, an open uh, profile that you have, can be used by companies to uh, leverage it for some campaigns or to identify people who have a broken machine or complaining about something, they would identify that and then answer to provide you a great experience, etc. So yes, UGCs are part of uh, the type of tools you can get. Um, then some tools around analytics and data visualization, so to track everything, to have dashboards, etc. on all the activities uh, happening online and on social media. So actually the idea of Sprinkler is to do all of these. When companies would only uh, focus on some point solution, with Sprinkler, you can do all of these, with, uh, which actually, and we'll see how, can, have an in, can help companies have an impact on their P&L. So these are a uh, high level view of all the modules that you can find in the, in the Sprinkler platform. Some of the modules are linked to marketing, to advertising, to research, to care, to commerce, and then to social in general. Um, not going to go into details of the modules. If, if you have questions about things that can be done with uh, some tools compared to others, you can ask to me so the problem, but what I'm really focus on, focusing on is the impact that these kind of tools can have on uh, the PNL of a company and how 
based on the strategy of a company, we can actually translate these into business use cases that are achievable through Sprinkler and through all the, the modules that we provide. All of these modules are connected, integrated. So the idea is really to not to have these silos. This is just a presentation of the, the modules to understand them, but there are no silos between them. What is self-care? Self-care. Yeah. Self-care is the fact that you would care just by, I mean, frequently asked questions is self-care. Oh, okay. So you go online and you look for a solution by yourself and you would have easily the answer to your problem. Chatbots can do self-care as well. And chatbots are integratable in the platform. So a company can use uh, the platform to manage the chatbot to do some automatic response or semi-automatic and then when they identify a keyword. So listening works a lot with keywords, identifying some keywords. Identifying some keywords on messages posted on every social media, would, they, would, they would get it and they can do that on chatbots as well. So I'm going to go forward with that. We call it an experience cloud overall. Just to give you a few uh, figures about the company. So it started, founded in 2009 by a guy called Raji Thomas. And uh, if you have the opportunity to look at some videos, he's pretty inspirational. Raji Thomas, so an Indian guy who went to the US, who created several companies, uh, who did his uh, MBA at NYU, then created Sprinkler in 2009. And actually, the, the, the company grew a lot over the past few years. Uh, today, we are, we are in 23 offices over the world over the globe. Um, uh, last, last funding last, uh, yeah, last funding was in 2016 with uh, 105 million for a valuation of 1.8 billion. And uh, yeah, about 1,400 1, employees. So we have many companies. I mean, just to give a few names here. So Shell, HP, Coca-Cola. Uh, Adidas, McDonald's, Gap, Nike, uh, NASA, Verizon, Citibank, etc., etc. So many sectors, and which is cool, is that the use cases are all different. And that's what I'm super excited by working on Sprinkler, is because I'm seeing new type of use cases, new types of uh, stories that we can build with all of these companies. And we're going to see a few examples of that. Just to give you an idea of the maturity in terms of uh, customer centricity because customer centricity is our motto and we evaluate the companies over this kind of maturity model um, and we have a lot of brand centric brands that we work with a few customer centric ones we have uh, so a lot of uh, criteria on e each of these stages and there are four criteria that actually make us think that a company goes from a brand-centric approach to a customer-centric approach. Having change agents in the companies, so people like you who are aware of digital disruption, uh, who are actually pushing within the company uh, digital disruption in general, having the, the sponsor, sponsorship of the execs is very important as well. Without the sponsorship of the execs on digital disruption, it's very hard to have a company move forward. Um, having some unified processes and uh, teams that would collaborate around digital disruption and transformation, and having the system of engagement that we've been talking about. So having a tool that is integratable, that is uh, comprehensive, and that would help uh, all the people, all the departments work together around the customer. So today we have one, only one company which is really customer centric, which is Nike. We've been working with them for five years. Um, so I, I, I don't have some slides on Nike because it's pretty confidential, but just to give you a few examples of what they do with Sprinkler, they would, for instance, identify the fact that someone is going to run a marathon in New York because they've been talking about that on Twitter, and they are going to become their special advisor. So they're going to be able to send them customized messages, uh, keep track of uh, what they're doing on social, and, uh, and in the end, at some point in the relationship, they may advise the, the athlete uh, about buying a new shoe. But this is not the main focus of Nike. Focus of Nike, the strategy of Nike, is to become the best advisor and the best partner uh, of all athletes, so all people who has two legs. Tell me. Already interacted with Nike, right? 
that, so someone, someone writing on Twitter, I am so happy I'm going to run the New York Marathon next year. Yeah. They can identify the word, the word marathon. Or they can identify New, New York. Actually, they can identify everything they want to identify. But you have to think about that previously. You have to think of a listening framework. This is something that is very important. Uh, all the frameworks for listening, so we talked about three things. Listening, engaging, and reaching. Listening, you need some frameworks to identify keywords, combinations of keywords, uh, things like this. Or uh, pictures you want to identify, a logo, um, a cup, I don't know, something in a picture that you want to identify. And you, you have to teach the machine uh, about on that, and they would identify all the pictures with the logo, etc., etc. Yeah. No, they call, actually, they call athletes everyone who works out. <laughs> but uh, for athletes, uh, because the athletes will generate enough revenue over their career for my but other people may not. So is it the cost justifiable for the target individual? So it's a good question. It's part of the, the, the strategy to, so to become partner of athletes because they think that this will actually have an impact on the PNL. They also have another objective, which is to go towards e-commerce because their margins are much higher through e-commerce. So they have, and they have a few other strategic pillars. Based on these two pillars uh, that are kind of the foundation of the strategy today, they want to push everything forward to achieve these objectives. So they are going to be the partners through um, of uh, athletes in general for several years. They will track everything and we'll see if the ROI is, uh, is positive or not. And they may adapt, adjust, and decide and tell the machine that it's no use to engage with some people because they are not worth it. But they have to track and see that over time. Yeah. So, so how do you guys help your clients and like how like construct uh, the algorithm to make it not be like creepy? Because like the like, and that's the hashtag, hashtag Mikey or something like that. Like if you just like a uh, tweet saying that oh I'm gonna run the marathon, it's gonna seem like a lot of people is too creepy to like, to receive a message yeah. from Nike. Yeah, they try to do it uh, the right way. So well, how do you guys draw the line? Like, how do clients to draw the line? Um, mm, I mean it's more their responsibility uh, than ours. Okay. We provide the tool, but then based on the, the, all the experience we have with other clients, we can give them some advice. Uh, in general, uh, if you do it well, the, the customer is delighted by being uh, reached out by Nike with a nice message, with something that is customized again. They, so actually, just to give you, I'm... Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's the CEO or the founder was an athlete, so yeah. he is doing 35, 40 years without the technology, so mm. he's the athlete. Yeah, and, and if they Nike just Nike congratulate you, you yeah. Nike is at Comcast right also. <laughs> exactly. If he you, you're going to be happy. In most cases, he's going to be delighted. Yeah, it's a love brand in the end. So if they congratulate you because you're going to run the marathon, are you going to be pissed off? Maybe not. Uh, and then, yeah, they would do it the right way. Again, yeah, that, that's not, not Comcast. Today, they have more than 200 million people kind of tagged in their, what we would call a social CRM. So based on information they would get on social in general, they would collect information, public data on their bio, so their activities, their location, their fields of interest, if they are married, if they have kids, if they have dogs, etc., 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 all this type of data can be retrieved. If it's public data, it can be retrieved and used in their uh, conversation with them, interactions with them on a daily basis. And did you manage to cross-reference uh, offline data for people who buy shoes in stores? With Actually, yes, because they are integrated with a CRM. So all the data that they would collect in the CRM, they w they can integrate both and. Uh, Taking it to take it into account when they are interacting with some people, um, and actually when they started, 
they use Sprinkler as something that would uh, send some data in the CRM. And very quickly, they figured out that the data that would be collected by Sprinkler would be much more important than the data they would have in the CRM. So now it's more the opposite. It's more this, the data from the CRM that is sent to Sprinkler, to the Sprinkler platform, and that actually they use on a daily basis to interact with people online, to interact with people on digital in general. Because they are also integrating that with applications like night running, etc. They are integrating that with chatbots, etc., etc. So all the kind of their front office online would be Sprinkler. So that means that any, anyone here who's been in touch with Nike in one way or another, even maybe offline buying a pair of shoes and gave his email, for instance, mm. Might, have, might be in their database. Yes. Potentially everyone. Yes. How do you work with the competitors in the same industry? Is there any kind of like Adidas? Like Adidas. What, what are the differences or strategies you see? And from your company's perspective, what are the conflicts mm -hmm. that you can create? So, <laughs> no, but that, that's a good question. Um, I think there is no, there is no technical conflict. I mean, databases are uh, completely separated. Everyone works on its own database, etc. Yeah, and strategy. We take that strategy and we transform that into business use case. So if Adidas uh, strategy is different from Nike's strategy, we won't have the same business use cases. We won't have the same listening frameworks. We won't uh, uh, set up the same rules because actually we have a rule and a rules engine that would allow um, I'm gonna, going to show you some examples of these rule engines, but w actually everything that w the platform is going to be customized to their strategy. So there is no conflict on that. The question I have, and I don't have an answer to this one, is what if all the sports companies use Sprinkler? Is there still an advantage to use Sprinkler? I think that the advantage will be if you use it uh, efficiently, so actually thinking of the right use cases. Thinking of the, I mean, working on your strategy, and depending on the strategy, you will succeed or not. Yes? Do you align also the data? I mean, because it's good to know how many likes you have, how many comments you have, but it's also good to compare with other and to know, yeah. I mean, in the market share, mm -hmm. uh, how much yes. you have to have the likes. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a benchmarking function that would actually allow to gather uh, data from all companies you want to, to track. So it can be in your sector or in other sectors. And you can have these kind of KPIs for all, uh, all companies. The limitation would be the APIs. So if Facebook doesn't allow you to look at some accounts that are not your clients, etc. So you can have these kind of limitations. Again, Twitter is completely open. Uh, some are completely open. Some others have some limitation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage to keep uh, yeah. along with all those changes and be ahead of everyone so you can uh, so advise to the yeah. company? Two answers to this. Um, Being a big company yourself, actually. Yeah, big, so. big but still with a startup uh, mindset. So first one is that the platform has been built. Reggie Thomas, the, found, the, found, the founder, the creator of the company, the founder, um, is an IT guy. It started by being an IT guy. So he knows about IT architecture. And one of the principles of the platform is really to be easily integratable to any new social media, for instance. So when a social media appears, we integrate it. And little by little, the idea was to start with the, the, the channels of the future, new social media, etc., and then little by little come back to old ones so that we would have that integrated as well. So we are going to integrate soon with emails. We are providing now live chat and these kind of things. The idea is to have a platform that is super integratable to any other things. If uh, Pokemon Go becomes the way uh, people would communicate with companies, we would integrate that as well. So on a technical point of view, we always do that. The, the second part of the answer is that we have very close partnerships with these social media. So we have super tight partnership with Twitter, but very good partnerships with uh, Facebook and with others as well. So we know in advance what is going to change on the platform, and we start working with them on the integration. So we have one company that is very advanced, Nike. We have 
bunch of companies who are still brand centric, not customer centric. Actually, it's very easy to, when we talk with some execs, I'm just finishing this. When you talk with some execs uh, about the strategy, it's like, a, it's like a lighting in your head. Like you're talking to me about your strategy and actually you're talking about your brand, talking about your product, you're talking about the services you provide, but without taking into account the customer, etc. This is this is one category of companies. And then you have another category of companies who will talk to you about the customers, about their objectives, about their needs, etc., etc., et and then talk to you about how the company is going to adapt to that. And it's like crystal clear that you have the ones who are going to succeed and the other ones. And little by little, these companies are going to become customer-centric. But they should do that quite fast if they don't want to be in the 40% that are going to disappear from the Forbes 2000 or Forbes 1000 in the next 10 years. Yes? Mm -hmm. Can the platform later be leveraged if they want to go customer-centric? Can they use the same platform to expand their... Yeah, so actually you don't have to, to implement the whole platform to start with. You can start with some modules just to publish, to interact, to, or to listen, etc. The idea, I mean, the more, the more modules you have, the better it is to become customer-centric because you can actually link everything you listen to uh, you, you actually listen to some actionable insights, which will help you provide a better customer experience. But again, it's very customizable as well. You can start with a little part and then grow. And uh, yeah. I'll just add two comments. Yeah. The, the brands. I saw that Google was on the on the list. <laughs> no, but no, but Google may be that for a reason. May be there for a reason. They are super. They are super advanced on digital technologies. But they may be techno centric and not always yeah, customer centric. Yeah. I would actually agree with that. The more product uh, centric than, than customer centric, uh, probably a little too many times. And then LVMH, it's interesting because it makes me think, and these folks here have to uh, come up with a. We have a class on luxury in uh, mm -hmm. two weeks. Okay. Uh, so they're going to study um, digital disruption in this sector. My take on this is that some brands, some the yes. top of the luxury brands, they need to stay brand centric even more than consumer centric. So, because they make yeah. the market. Uh, it's, it's the, it's the company yes. to follow them and not the other way around. That's, that's yes and no. a very radical view. No, no, but yes and no. I mean, we are working with Rolex, for instance, and they clearly established the fact that, yeah, they are Rolex and they don't care. And they don't say that they don't care about the customers. Otherwise, they wouldn't use Sprinkler for customer care. Uh, but they are brand centric and they have a, reasons to, a reason to be brand centric. But I'm sure you can find some examples where even luxury brands have been disrupted by some new uh, brands that would be customer centric. Not in the luxury industry, but let's take cosmetics, which is not the same thing, that's for sure. But you have a L'Oreal, for instance, which is a great client of us. But L'Oreal, over the past few years, uh, or over the past 10 years, let's say, they were very product centric. They were trying to do the best products, et cetera, et cetera. They were not listening or looking at all the new trend of people doing blogs, uh, influencers on the cosmetic industry, et cetera. And not, they were not really listening to what was happening in the world. So they were just trying to make the best products and without taking really into account the, the customer needs. And now they are changing that, but Again, I think that luxury can be disrupted as well on this. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with this. The question is more like the very, very top brands. Mm -hmm. whether they, uh, they have an, an identity and they, want, they don't want to change their identity. That's for sure. But uh, yeah. Another question? So we have a few ones who are actually in the middle of this, uh, this maturity model. Uh, Nestle, McDonald's, Verizon, P&G. They, yeah, they are doing a lot of stuff to become customer centric. My daily work, my daily job, that's what I do for a living. I talk with uh, some execs about their strategy and I see how we can actually translate the why, so the vision, into a what and a how, so a roadmap about what we can do with Sprinkler. Just to start with, do you have any definition for digital? There are many of them. How do you define digital? You, for instance. Digital. Yeah, digital, what's digital? 
if you are at a dinner and you, t you say that you are in the share digital disruption, but what's digital? All right, another definition. Uh, something you can manage behind the screen. OK. <laughs> yes? An activity between teams and people not physically. Hmm. Interesting, yes. I mean, again, there are many definitions. <laughs> so, well, I will give you the definition I, I like to use because it's pretty easy. Um, and I've been using it over the past few years, so as of now it works. So it's actually the impact on, of these new technologies on three pillars. Yeah. So impact of these new technology, which are social, mobility, analytics, and AI, etc. Cloud, and IoT for Internet of Things. So the acronym SMACT that exists for several years now. SMACT, impact of these, so social, mobility, analytics, cloud, and IoT on three pillars, business models, customer experience, and operations. And the, the three pillars, the impact of digital, it's, uh, it's based on a model built by the MIT and Capgemini Consulting, so you can look for it if you want the, the analysis of these pillars, but yeah, it's very easy to 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 link an initiative, a digital initiative, to one of these pillars. What's, what actually, uh, what Sprinkler does, it's mainly the impact of social on the customer experience. And actually, so I used to be a consultant for Capgemini Consulting, and the, I can, uh, I've been able to see that consulting companies that are specialized on digital topics are very aware of the MACT. Not the the S, not the social activities, and how social can have a huge impact on the PNL, uh, on the profit and losses of companies. So it's very interesting for us at Sprinkler to have this ability to partner with some consulting companies and to work on the social aspects of a novel digital transformation strategy. So now, what is a social or digital transformation or disruption strategy, what is it, it is, what is it, it is made of or composed of, there are three, usually three parts, again, uh, these are just a few examples, models, etc. you can adapt that to many companies, but there is always a why, a reason why a company has to change and a vision, uh, usually, I mean, it should be linked to the vision of the transformation of the company in, in general, then the what, which would be a list of use cases, business use cases, not functional ones, uh, or high level initiatives. And then the how, which are the roadmap and the, the way a company is going to operate, to execute the operating model and the roadmap. And this is something that is very important and that many people who have been trained uh, in MBAs or in masters like you, your masters, etc., are not very familiar with. You, are, you probably work a lot on strategy, on, uh, you, you do a lot of case studies of a strategy, etc. But the how is something that is very important for companies because without the how, without the execution and the way of executing everything, it's very hard to achieve the strategy. So a few examples on the why, they are not completely up to date, but the why of some companies, so Michelin, L'Oréal, Nestlé, Air France, and well, every word in this kind of, uh, of visions are very important. So ensure Michelin's leadership in digital mobility by 2020, you see that it's not linked to tires only, it's not linked to, um, to restaurants or things like this either, either. It's about mobility, the concept of mobility, et cetera, et cetera. And while well, these kind of visions uh, are heavily thought, and then the important thing is to see how to translate these visions into something that is more at a level of the initiatives, the corporate initiatives or business initiatives that can be again structured, etc., and then operating models and roadmaps. So we're not going to go into too many details right now. If you're interested in the operating models, there are a lot of uh, resources in terms, yeah, articles explaining how a company has to be organized around digital, etc. If you want some references, don't hesitate to reach out to me. 
and uh, I will give you the, the articles. So the overall approach that I usually use with some companies it's, uh, yeah, is to start with an audit, an audit on how they use social today. And what is the, do they use it on a very functional way just to interact with some people? Or do they already have uh, some comprehensive business use cases that will have an impact on their business? And then after making or doing this audit, we'll do uh, very comprehensive workshops that can last from three hours to two days, where we would start by some ideation, ideation, ideation meaning providing a lot of ideas of what you can do with social based on case studies. We're going to see a few case studies afterwards. Based on customer journeys, you probably have worked on customer journeys, yes? Um, and well, identifying pain points and identifying the ways that digital can solve these pain points or uh, research on the industry, etc. Um, I mean, all this kind of, of research to provide them with some ideas of what they could do with uh, social and with digital in general, but with social uh, when we are working for Sprinkler. Then identification and qualification. The idea at this stage is really to identify the use cases that are relevant for them, for the companies. And uh, we don't want to be the one who will actually do make the strategy by ourselves. We want them to choose their relevant use cases. And then prioritization, there are several techniques about that, but that would uh, help the companies to decide if this use case is a quick win that they have to launch very quickly with a, an important stake or an important uh, outcome, or if it's something that is more complicated and that will take more time. And they will build a very actionable roadmap. The important word is, here is actionable. Uh, we want it to be yeah, super detailed so that they just have to actually give the money and launch the project. Um, so if you, I'm going to go quickly because I don't know if this is something that is very interesting for you or not. Just giving you an idea of my daily job and the way that we interact with some companies. Um, so these are examples of slides we would use. Something that is very important at this stage is to, to be customer centric even for us. So we start with uh, the, the strategy of the companies we're talking to. We don't start with explaining our clouds, our uh, modules, etc. No, we start by integrating the objectives of the company we're working with because we want to customize everything we do to their strategy. How much time do you give yourself to the audit phase? Um, so the audit in itself is not the most important part. Uh, but it would take a few days to understand what tools they are using, how they are using uh, them. Uh, the idea is to have a current state, the, what they are doing today. Depending on the, the maturity of the customer, of the client, in um, general they are not using it, they are not uh, doing it to its full potential. And it's pretty easy to see that it's quite limited compared to what we can do with social today. Uh, so there is the audit part, which would take a few few days. Then preparing the workshop takes much more time because you have to think of the, you have to put yourself into their feet or to take their perspective to be actually customer centric and to, to think, okay, so now we are dealing with a tire company, Michelin. What Michelin could benefit from social? Or rather, what prevents Michelin from be, being customer centric today? Then based on these questions, you would identify a lot of use cases. Uh, why, don't they, uh, why don't they leverage influences? Why don't they, uh, how could they become advisors like Nike does with athletes? How could they become advisors for everyone who has a car? Things like this. And there are many questions that you can think of to translate uh, the objective of becoming customer centric into uh, some use cases you can achieve with Sprinkler. So then uh, ideation, providing case studies. We're gonna talk about, so here is case study for McDonald's. We're gonna talk about this later on. On top, you can't see the image very well. You can't see the image at all. It's about Microsoft. I'm sorry for that. It's about Microsoft who actually takes into, who identifies thousands of people talking about products uh, they, they provide, such as uh, uh, the Xbox. And they would identify people talking about the Xbox, maybe sending a picture, things like this. 
they take it, they transform it in a funny way with some jokes, etc., and then send it back like a message uh, based on the picture that was posted by a customer. And the idea is to delight them or to surprise them, etc. I mean, to to change their image, <laughs> not to be the all the all Windows Microsoft. Um, so ideation. So we, yeah, we gave examples of use cases, etc., that are relevant for our clients. Once we go into the identification and qualification phase, so we want them. We can do that through small workshops, etc. We want them to be the ones who decide which use cases are relevant for them. And depending on the people we have in the rooms, the higher in the hierarchy, the better, because they will, it will be easier to align all the teams around the strategy. Um, but yes, so we want them to identify the right business use cases. So you can't see again, but here you have, maybe I have a zoom on that. Yes, so examples of business use cases. Identifying leads to drive subscription. This was for a newspaper in the UK, newspaper group. So not only newspapers, but tabloids, etc. In the, in the UK. So identifying leads to drive subscription. Provide a seamless customer care to increase customer satisfaction and limit churn. Leverage paid, owned, and earned uh, rep uh, reporting capability. You all know what earned, owned, and paid is. Type of uh, advertising. So yeah, I'm going to write it on the, on the board. So paid for paid advertising. So sponsored posts, for instance, on social. Earned. So earned mentions. So people who would write with the name of a company, these are own mentions, earned mentions, sorry, and owned, which uh, is actually everything that is posts, posted by a company and that is not paid. Okay. Um, so yeah, leverage these, uh, these different things with tracking the impact, the reach of all of these, of paid, owned, and earned. For in order to identify which is the content that performs well, the own content that performs well to use it in the paid campaigns. Um, another example about building a 360 view of the customer, social CRM we talked about for Nike, for instance. Identifying emerging trends uh, to adapt the content they post and know their market, their competitors, etc. So these are a few examples that are linked to increasing the revenue would have other examples to decrease the cost or to mitigate the risk. So once we have identified these use cases, we want to uh, qualify the, the business outcome, the positive business outcome, identify the associated KPIs for all of these use cases, all of these use cases. This is kind of the positive part and then how operational it is or how hard it will be to implement. So the, the right part about in, impacts in terms of people and processes, how much you are going to have to change the people, the organization and the processes, uh, the impact in terms of uh, yeah, collaboration between teams and in technology, the integrations that you will have to, to uh, plan with other systems. Once you have all of these use cases and you have these qualification, you can put that in a stakes feasibility matrix. So here are about 15 use cases that we identified for this uh, media group in the UK. Some of the use cases are very, very important and the stakes are very high, which means that the business outcome is very high. You put that towards the, the right. Feasibility, when it's very easy to implement, you put it at the top. And based on this, you can define different phases for the digital transformation strategy. And well, what we do afterwards is really to go into details uh, of the roadmap. So, uh, giving examples of well, description of the use case, the positive impact, associated KPIs that they will have to track in the next few years, different levels of implementations, uh, impact in terms of people, process, and technology, calendars over the next two years. I mean, these are things that can take time. Uh, we talked about frameworks, for instance. They will have to think about defining the right frameworks for listening uh, without a good framework. It will be worthless to have such a tool like Sprinkler for listening. And then you have to implement the different rules that would go from listening 
to any team that could use the content that they will identify. And so based on that, we defined some overall calendars for the next two years. So this was another view of how we can define a digital slash social strategy. Is something that resonates? Yeah. Yes. Yes. How how do you uh, create your strategy? How your strategy is different from a B two C player to a B two B player? Mm -hmm. Second question. Uh, for example, a B two B player like Mishna, uh, if their customers, the B two C players, are not customer centric, does it help for them to become customer centric, or what can they do? Two very good questions. Um, so first about Michelin specifically, they are B2B, but they are trying to become B2C. So they are acquiring some uh, e-commerce platforms around Tire, etc. Uh, but this is not the answer. <laughs> but this is just for you, for you to know. Um, so yes, B2B and B2C, a platform like Sprinkler, it's like easier to understand for B2C, that's clear. But for B2B, it's also very important. It's very important to know, to listen to, listen to the customers who would talk about the, the fact that they are they're having problems with the tire and then provide a seamless social customer care, things like this. And you can actually identify many, uh, many use cases for B2B as well. Um, because in the end, there is a final customer. And same for Nike. Nike is a B2B and B2C. They are selling a lot of shoes through stores. So actually, there is not such a division between B2B and B2C. You can find a lot of um, crisis management, identifying yeah, a, crisis, a, crisis, a crisis on social media, something that Michelin would have to do. Because a crisis, if uh, the tire of a plane explodes, they have to know that super rapid, yeah, super quickly to be able to react. They would also have to prepare for that, to have the plan to react on social media and uh, before it becomes a thing and before the brand value of Michelin would decrease a lot. Second question was? Uh, yeah. If the B2C player is not customer-centric, well, even if the B2B player is yeah. super customer-centric. But when you buy a tire, I mean, you don't buy a tire every other day, that's for sure. And I don't know if you have ever bought a tire. Uh, but um, the, you're going to buy your brand, you're going to buy the quality around the brand, the brand reputation, etc. And uh, it's an overall process. So if Michelin is, is customer centric, they will be able to increase their brand value. And even if there are some intermediaries, people will look for the Michelin tire. Plus, you can do some specific paid advertising, you can do a lot of things. Even if there is this retailer, you can actually sell your tire online. I mean, sell the idea of buying your t your tire, and then the people would buy them at the store. So yeah. So what you're doing is trying to help the companies to raise their brand awareness, etc. Uh, but in the end, what companies want is to sell more. Yes. So do you measure it? And if yes, how? And is your business model linked to the result? So if we don't provide results to the companies, if we don't have an impact on the PL of the companies we're working with, uh, we're going to be in a short-term company that will collapse very soon. Because we're, not the, we're kind of expensive. So yes, this is something we definitely track. Um, so we've seen some examples of uh, use cases linked to increasing revenues for the, the media group, for instance. Identifying leads. It's very clear. You identify, a lead, you identify a lead because someone is talking about your brand or talking about, well, let's go to tires again. Someone posting online, uh, I have to change the tires of my car. Any advice, guys? You identify that, it's a lead. And then how you treat it, uh, well, you, ha you can have, a, there are some ways to react more rapidly than other companies, etc that will convert the lead into a sale, into a sale. And uh, you can track it by connecting that to the CRM or to connecting it to, um, yeah, to the CRM mainly. So yes, the idea is to track as many uh, impact on the PNL as possible. It's not always easy, that's for sure. Um, 
and it's something you do over time. It's not easy to provide an ROI before starting because I will give you the example of customer care. Several companies, when we talk to them about customer care, social customer care, well, on the cost side, it's easy. It's much uh, less expensive to do social customer care than call centers, for instance, because you would, um, you would close the case at the first response because you have time to prepare for it and you close the case. Whereas when someone calls you on a call center, it's not that easy. Um, overall, social customer care is six times less expensive than call centers. So this is on the cost side. But then many companies tell, tell us that, well, they have no one reaching them on social. So it's, there's no reason why implementing a social customer care solution. The thing is that when they start doing that, providing social customer care to the customer, the, the increase rate is huge because it's like word of mouth. People would talk about it and when someone is going to look for something online, they will immediately see that there is a social customer care available. Um, but yeah, I mean, the ROI is clearly the, the big question and we try to track everything linked to that because that's the, the way we will keep on growing. Yeah. So questions? All right, so let's go. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you, because um, it seems very, uh, it seem easy, but uh, it seems very fluid when you're describing the process to which you go at first with your clients, you know, the, the, the audit, then the workshop. But I can Im I imagine that there's a lot of resistance to change, and sometimes it doesn't work as easy as That's you right. described it. Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about the, the, the the pain points or the resistance to disruption that you may have encountered mm -hmm. with some clients without naming them? Yeah, sure. So I can give you some uh, success criteria, how, how it can work efficiently. It works well when you have execs in the room during the workshop because it will be much easier to align the teams. The other way is to have some people that may understand digital better but are lower in the hierarchy and they will be empowered to go to the board and ask for some budget, etc., based on the result of the project. This not works every time. When you have execs in the room, then align, they align on a strategy, digital strategy, that's easier. Then you need some change agents. We talked a little bit about that before. You have some people in the rooms that you have to uh, to empower and to use as your relay. Relay, relay. Yeah, I mean, to use them as uh, your advocates. I mean, it's kind of a game as well. You identify the detractors, you identify the advocates, and you try to convince based on uh, case studies, based on customer journeys, et cetera, et cetera, to convince the whole room. And usually you manage to get everyone at the table thanks to the marketing team, the one signing? Mm. Uh, it depends. It can be marketing, it can be CDOs, chief digital officers, uh, who usually understand very easily what you want to explain to them, but they don't have a lot of budget. So you can also count on the CIOs, who sometimes understand a little bit less, but have much more budget. And uh, so yeah, marketing, digital, CIO. But the idea is to have in the room as many departments as possible, because with a tool like Sprinkler, you can have impact on the on HR, on uh, so customer care, on PR, public relations. You can have impact on everything because you are going to identify influencers, and these influencers will be used by yeah sales, of course. Uh, influencers will be used by public relations to increase the to improve the, the brand uh, awareness, etc. So the idea is really to have all the people we can have, all the departments we can have. So that at the end of the workshop, we are aligned on a strategy. And otherwise, we give up. I mean, if we can't, with a lot of people from different departments, uh, define a strategy that, or a roadmap that is linked to their strategy, that's because there are either lack of maturity on their side or misunderstanding from our side, these kind of things. But uh, that does not happen too many times. <laughs> That happened. So let's talk about some. So we've been talking about use cases, etc. Let's go into more uh, concrete examples. So um, mm, mm, yeah, 
So our point of view is that experience is the new brand. We've been talking about experience in general. And that social is the foundation for the customer experience management. So we, we've been talking about these five pillars, marketing, advertising, uh, research, commerce, and care. Just to give you a few stats on that, marketing, 90% of the people, of the customers, say that buying decisions are influenced by peer reviews. Is it your case? Are you influenced by peer reviews? Do you look at the, the rating and reviews on Amazon before going to the store to buy something? So you are part of these 90%. Uh, 2.8 billion people are connected with real identities on social media. So actually you can use the, I mean, it's easy to connect uh, people using their name to what you have in the CRM, for instance, or things like this. Uh, 23,000 reviews are posted on Yelp every minute. 86% of the people will hesitate to purchase from a business with negative reviews. So, yeah. And 76% uh, of, of the people who have a good social care experience recommend the brand. Just a few stats around the experience. So how we would translate, well, what others say matters more than what you say when you're a company. That's something that it's really, it's uh, something that is very different from 10 or 15 years ago. Advertising has to be personalized. Research has to be real time and always on. Conversations control commerce. And care is the new marketing. These are some point of views or uh, thoughts for you. I mean, you can, if you have some reactions on that or let me know, but this is something that we've been seeing with many companies over time. Uh, the type of metrics you want to to look at, so just a few examples, but the number of CXM profiles, so the number of profiles you have in this kind of social uh, CRM, number of digital impressions for advertising, the economic impact of insights, so yes, and they all the link with the ROI, so is that attributable to digital again, the ROI, and speed of cases closed in digital for customer care. Few examples, we're going to more details with some of these, but Microsoft, for instance, built a command center. So a command center is a huge screen with uh, data updated, like uh, on ongoingly upda updated. Build a command center that listens to conversations and delivers custom content to 24,000 people, uh, 24,000 daily interactions to nurture leads for 28 global brands. So this can give you an idea of what is done automatically with a few people, I don't know exactly how many people use that, but most of it is completely automated. Dell created a Black Friday campaign that dynamically identified audience segments based on the quality, on quality and likelihood to convert, which increased sales by 150%. McDonald's used social listening to discover, and we'll get into details on this one, to discover the all day breakfast trend I'm going to go into details right now about that. I will to tell you the story. Uh, so in 2015, McDonald's was having some 14 quarters of growth decrease. So it was not decreasing, but the growth, the growth was decreasing. They used social media to identify some trends or things that would help them recover. And they identified the fact that in the US mainly, people would asked to have the breakfast all day when it used to stop at 10.30 in the morning. And this is something very significant for McDonald's because they are the first buyers of eggs in the US, so maybe in the world, but in the US. And the, one of the, the ways they actually did their business case to see if it was relevant to extend the breakfast to the whole day was based on the number of mentions of breakfast all day, people saying, I would like to have my breakfast at uh, 11, at 12, at whatever, whatever hour, etc. Based on a lot of keywords, they identified that the, the number of people interested in this would be, uh, would be high enough to launch this operation. And what they did is, so launching the all-day breakfast cost a, a little bit of yeah, launching that, but 
the cost, the cost of the marketing campaign was zero, except for the sprinkler license. <laughs> what they did was to identify all the people who had talked about this topic since 2007 or 2008. And they found several thousands of people talking about that. They used the information they would have in what we call the social CRM to send them some customized messages. And based on that, I mean, it creates everyone who received this kind of message like, yeah, that's great. You're going to at least a message received 10 years later or five years later. Yes, yeah, that's McDonald's. We have heard you. You're going to get your all day breakfast. I mean, breakfast at uh, two in the afternoon. Just go to this uh, McDonald's uh, close to, to where you, you live, etc., And we'll delight you with a free breakfast. Well, everyone reposted it, shared this, and it created a massive campaign. Massive campaign that translated it into a lot of mentions in newspapers, in uh, digital newspapers, etc., etc., and after a few a few days, everyone in the U.S. was aware of that. And even with a zero uh, dollar cost of campaigns, everyone was aware of that. And you can see a very clear impact of this action on their business because after 14 quarters of uh, growth diminution they reversed completely their profits and revenues in 2015. Yeah? Uh, what do you think about when it happens but it have a, has a negative outcome like the set one plus uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard about this one. <laughs> uh, but I think that it was badly managed. So you can create some very, uh, I mean, you have to think of all the impacts. You can think of, and I have the example, for instance, of the, uh, the, um, yeah, uh, please. It's about uh, <laughs> you did made a show called Rick and Morty that mentioned uh, promotional sauce that McDonald's produced for the launch of <laughs> So <laughs> McDonald's tried to capitalize on that by relaunching the sauce at some very limited outlets and offering some very poor uh, promotional uh, products from the show without the show's uh, without the show's actual permission or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to be careful with what to do with social, that's for sure. There are many examples of uh, backlashes like this one. I'm um, thinking of the Pepsi one, we'll have the pictures of uh, Kendall Jenner making an advertising online. Maybe you have seen it, otherwise you should see it, I mean it's horrible. And they had a very bad reaction after that. We're going to talk quickly about that later on. They are, uh, are you into gaming? E-gaming, gaming? No? Who is in gaming? Who looks, who watches Twitch? One? Okay. Two, one and a half. Uh, <laughs> uh, electronic Arts launch recent, yeah, you know. All right, you know the story, do you want to tell it to? Battlefront hmm? Battlefront. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's right. But it was just to profile you guys. Okay. <laughs> uh, so Battlefront 2 launched a microtransaction uh, system in, uh, in game, in one of its games, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Uh, and it offers for people to, uh, in addition to paying for the full game, paying for, uh, paying for to advance within the game. So not only are you paying full price for the game, you're also paying for the content you already paid for. So people were outraged about this uh -huh. and the company share went down by, uh, I don't know, like 10% after people found out. Mm. And then they, uh, they canceled the whole thing and, uh, and tried to recover. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, this kind of example, you can find a lot of them. Uh, but yes, you have to be careful with social because, as we've seen, it has such a huge impact on that you have to be very careful. Michael Kors, and actually, just to go back to Sprinkler and crisis management, because you have this kind of crisis, you have some rules that would send immediately a message to the CEO if the number of mentions uh, associated to your brand 
is associ associated to some negative sentiment because there is also an automated way of understanding the, the sentiment positive of, or negative of the messages or some pictures, etc. So whenever the number of mentions uh, gets higher, it's sent to the C uh, CEO or to some other people who are in charge of uh, managing a crisis. So commerce, an example on, on commerce, launched, uh, so Michael Kors launched interactive shoppable campaign uh, with influence uh, and UGCs. You all know what UGCs are. On .com, using data to drive revenue and personalized experiences across marketing and sales. And Philips established, established social as the foundation for CXM, so customer experience management, to drive collaboration between marketing, care, and product to orchestrate more effective campaigns and growth. These are just a few examples of what you can do with a platform like Sprinkler. A few figures. So Microsoft has actually more than 400 million people in their CXM profiles, so social CRM. So the increase of sales after the all-day breakfast, more than 5%. And Philips, customer care, 90% of cases handled in less than one hour, which is a good, good figure, especially for French standards online. Uh, here you have a few examples of other type of use cases you can address with social. Imagination is the limit. You can take into account uh, the strategy or the objectives of a company and translate it, especially with listening. You can listen to anything you think about. So marketing, you can identify and engage with advocates and influencers. So again, you would identify these influencers by listening to them, listening to some specific uh, subjects, to their fields of interest, etc. their reach. You can put them in categories with some rules. You can put them in a bucket and then use them as influencers on this uh, specific topic. And actually, this, yeah, this can be used for, I have an example in, uh, that just came to me, uh, wealth management banking, interested in clients that are, have at least more than $30 million to play, to invest and play, play with money. Well, they would like to identify some very specific people who are interested in uh, early stage startups in biotechnology uh, living in Singapore, all these kind of conditions, they can use them in a listening framework to identify the very few people that can be interesting for them. So it can be done at a very huge level, Nike, Microsoft, etc., or it can be done for a very specific niche and you can do everything with just the listening framework. So marketing, you can optimize your content and deliver against interest. Uh, optimize your content because you're going to track everything linked to a content, the reach, the likes, the, uh, the shares, etc., 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 and you can use it to improve the content you're going to publish. You can detect crises and mitigate brand risk. You can leverage trends to inform campaigns. In advertising, you can manage and buy, uh, manage buying and reporting across channels. So in advertising, you could leverage the social uh, CRM, so all the information you have on people, and then, well, provide them with the right advertising. So it can be very targeted, can be very personalized. Can segment audiences and target uh, always on lead generation. Can adjust creative in real time based on customer behavior. Uh, you can analyze competitor campaigns and content. You can identify insights and trends to inform your product development. You can leverage post-purchase reviews, so we talked about reviews and ratings. Uh, you can solicit reviews based on a positive brand uh, conversation, so you can kind of influence your NPS. Customer care, we've talked a little bit about that as well, so these are just a few examples. I had planned for a few, a focus on retail because, I mean, we could focus on many uh, verticals. Retail is a very good one, among others, but. Uh, just to focus on a few use cases and explain to you how it works and then you will definitely, I mean, you see that it's easy to transpose to other industries. Retail, I guess it's a sector you know pretty well. Uh, a few trends just to have them in mind. So on the industry, you have a slowing brick and mortar and growth. You have online sales and digital growing, and you have competition very high. All people that will just tell, talk about your brand on 
on all the on social media that you don't monitor. You identify these people and they are automatically sent to the right people in the company who are going to be able to answer in their language, on their channel, and being customer centric. These people, these agents, uh, so there is an automated routing towards them, and these people will be able to use some asset libraries, social asset libraries, so pieces of content that are already ready for an answer on social. You can set up some, uh, well, you track everything at all stages, that's for sure, so performance measurement. You can set up some legal and marketing approvals, for instance, so the message that is going to be sent by an agent can be reviewed from, by marketing and legal, so that you're sure that you're compliant with the, with the brand guidelines. You integrate that with the CRM, so actually you have all the information coming from CRM when you uh, send your answer, and can actually, um, yeah, you can, the, the information can go both ways, from Springfield to the CRM or from the CRM to Springfield. You can stop outbound, uh, meaning you have a kill switch button. So if there is a huge crisis, and um, I have a sad example, McDonald's in Germany, terrorist attack in a McDonald's. It's not the right moment to promote your brand when, there are, when this just happened. So what they can use is just a, a switch button, click on a button, every outbound will be shut down. So this is very useful for this kind of brands as well, because otherwise they can create a important crisis. And then potential upsell, because it's <coughs> never easier to sell someone who is reaching out to you than the opposite.